pan of spaghetti. I got down to 127 pounds. I was a, I was a starving rat. You know, <laughs> they say starving rats are healthier than them. And my food. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> uh, let, let's see. Um, anyway, uh, it's kind of you, you get you have your your breakfast, and then they take you to the flight line. And um, the flight line this is probably about six o'clock now, and it's cold. It was it was January when we got over there, and it's cold. And um, uh, you finally get in the airplane, and we don't have radios telling us when to taxi out to the takeoff, but there's a lot of noise. There's a plane taking off, and um, somebody from a truck bed signals that we have to start turn to get out on the runway. So we get out there, and you only got um, about a mile of steel matting to get off the ground. You got 60,000 pounds of four ton of bomb, 3,600 gallons of gasoline, 100 octane, 10 personnel, and uh, you got to get off in that length of time. And you're darn sure, better sure, all those motors are going to keep going because if they don't, you're not going to get off. And this was kind of scary, but I didn't know I was scared. But I guess I was. Because <laughs> uh, we would get those things going, pull the brakes, get those things going, let off the brakes, and then go down the runway. Gosh, that thing didn't seem to go very fast. And that end was coming up awfully fast. But by golly, we always, in our case, always, some people, always people, we always got off. Sometimes we took the dirt, you could see it pumping up. And that old airplane would gradually climb. So we get out of there. But anyway, no matter, he's, here's the story he's interested in. Uh, no matter what I did on the ground, before takeoff, or no matter what I did, 12,000 feet, 10,000 really, you had to put on your oxygen masks. And at that altitude, I found that I had to go to the bathroom. And always. And, uh, 24 has no bathroom. Um, so what do, I, what do I do? I, well, I nudged Chet and told him I was going to have to be gone for a few minutes. And I would go down to the uh, Bam Bombay doors. Now, I'm wearing very, very a suit over that. Gloves. Something like that. I got a parachute on. Heavy boots. Incidentally, the boots are uh, electrified. You plug in, and they're supposed to keep your feet warm. But usually, one is hot, the other is cold. <laughs> didn't, didn't work. That good. But anyway, I, I disconnected from all that, got back to the Bombay doors, and uh, then I had to, with all that stuff on, I had to find the plumbing. And uh, then I had a, a little Cracker Jack box. It was a seed ration box, and. After finding the plumbing, filling up the box, I cracked open the bomb bay doors. Not so much that if I fell, I wouldn't go through. <laughs> no, the wind was blowing. We were moving at 160 miles an hour, and I was taking off. And uh, I had my little, my kind of, it wasn't a real bomb. But it, <laughs> 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 we were over in Italy. And I decided to drop it through the doors. I should have gotten down closer. I dropped it from here, and the darn thing with all that wind, it blew it all right. <laughs> and uh, it kind of disgusted. I, I got the door shut, went back to my station. What? <laughs> I put the gloves back on. It gets very cold up there. It gets about 30 below zero. And I uh, got my mask on, and we flew to the target and uh, it's about 25,000 feet, 30 degrees below zero. The engineer, and at, at three minutes out from the target, the engineer opens up the mountain bay doors. And he came up to me and he said, I can't get the doors open. I said, I figured that maybe the moisture got in there and they froze. And I said, well, I think if you take a hammer and hit them, they'll open up. This is what happens on missions. And sure enough, they opened, and we dropped our bombs. <laughs> That's the story that you. <laughs>
you, you got to tell that story on an honor flight too, right? An honor oh, flight a couple oh, years ago. You know, I, I never talked about any of this until after that honor flight. You know what the honor flight is? Yeah. Yeah, the World War II vets, they wanted them to see the, the memorial. So Arizona sent my daughter and myself <coughs> down there, free for me, she had to pay something, yeah. um, to see that. And uh, uh, what were we going to talk about? You're in the Capitol building, right? Oh, oh yeah. We were in the Capitol building being grouped. They only took us in groups of 12 or so. But in our group, the uh, one of the guards that was taking us around, said, I'm going to take you on a special tour, just us. And he took us into the uh, room that the vice president uses when he's on duty in the Senate building. And uh, he asked each of us to tell a war story. War story. Well, everybody told one, and I didn't have my yellow shirt on, so he didn't recognize me. And so I didn't volunteer anything. But my daughter, sitting over there, <laughs> said, you haven't talked to this guy yet. So. So I told them my story. Everybody would tell them about how they've been shot and wounded and all that. So I told them the story that I just been telling you. <laughs> Vice President's Office of the Senate. Yeah, it's a good story. You always fought in the Liberator. Yes, yes. You, you never transferred to the b well, um, when so the, got, the question was, were you always in a Liberator? Did you use any other aircraft? Yeah, well, um, we uh, they gave us an old airplane when the war was over, yeah. and uh, told us to fly it back by way of uh, Gander and uh, New England, which we did. And, and, that, and they gave us another old airplane to do this. They're supposed to have a automatic. Uh, you're supposed to be able to fly it, turn it over. But we had to fly it all the way, yeah. and we flew it, flew it to England, New England, and through a, a big storm, we couldn't get above it, we couldn't go under, and again we shook up everybody in the back. My gosh, we turned the wheel way off one way, and this airplane was still tipping over. But we made it back anyway. And uh, we, uh, nobody, when we landed in New England, nobody met us with whistles and everything. We just got piled into a truck and they took everything away from us, except the watch. They let me keep my watch. But I, I had a pistol. They took that. I didn't want that anyway. I never even carried that on my missions because they said if you bail out and they see a revolver on you, they're going to shoot you. And I said, heck, I can't hit anything with it. Why would I take it? So I didn't even carry it. But anyway, when we got there, they said, well, look, uh, um, that we're going to reassign you. Uh, wouldn't you like to fly a B-29? I said, where? Yeah. Japan. Well, I wasn't really ready to go out of the States again. I said, but you got something else. They said, training command. I said, well, I'll take the training command. So they were going to train me to teach instrument, instrument flying to people. And I, I liked that. So they were going to send me to California to do that. And uh, matter of fact, that's when I decided to, we decided to get married, my wife and I. I, I, I was a terrible romantic guy. I said, do you want to get married? She said, yeah. <laughs> I said, you got two weeks, we're going to California. <laughs> now we're never romantic than we get. <laughs> she took me up on it, and I said, the, the honeymoon, I said, is troop train to the California coast. <laughs> She said, I don't call it funny. But anyway, that's the way we, that's what I started finding. I got back into an AT-6. That's what I was going to teach instruments in. But pretty soon the war ended in Japan, and I got out. Question for you. When you were at Fosio, what, what were most, where were most of the targets that your missions were assigned? The, the question was, uh, when you were in uh, Pantanal and your Fosia, uh, where were most of your missions? Oh, I got to tell you one of them. <laughs> Uh, Northern Italy and Southern Germany. Uh, oh, you don't have a map. I, don't have. Uh, I do have a map, yeah. Sorry. Well, we could get way up into Romania. The Palesti oil fields are up there. And, uh, uh, in fact, we hit that. I wasn't there at that time, thank goodness, but we hit it a number of times and lost over 350 
bombers were investigating all that. That's another interesting thing. Uh, there were 3,400, I checked this number, 3,477 bombers with the 15th Air Force for the year and a half that was in operation in Italy. And of that, uh, 3,700, 1,777 were lost. So that's almost half, just not half of them were lost. Well, that was a lot of Germany's oil that they tried to wreck. Yeah. And it took yeah. a lot more than that to ruin it. Yeah, so we, Hitler would run out of oil. Sure. Yeah, we were getting refineries, railroad yards, and uh, that sort of thing. But in April, somewhere around April 10th, early part of April, we were running out of strategic retirements. Yeah. So they said, well, we'll make you a tactical Air Force. And what, if you, all of you, I know, remember when the line, the German line was halfway up the boot, yeah. uh, about where it was in Italy. We were about 60 miles away from that south of it. Yeah. Uh, there was a, the English were on the eastern end of it, and the, and the uh, Americans were on the western end of it. And it wasn't moving. So they thought, well, why don't we let the 15th Air Force bomb three miles over the line? That'll stir them up a little bit. Maybe we'll get that moving. So what would they decide to do? A lot of, a lot of the big guys wanted to go parallel with that line. And we said, no, because they'll shoot at us. <laughs> Let's go straight across. So they agreed, we'll go straight across. But they said also, instead of flying at 25,000 feet, we're going to let you fly at 15. So the accuracy would be greater. And also, they, the accuracy was greater. <laughs> they could hit you. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, we, we decided to hit the English first, the English side. This is Lubo. Lubo, L U D O, Italy. I think that's what it was called, and that's what it's spelled. And uh, they said, "Now we don't want you bombing our people." So, so here's a you'll see a big white arrow on the ground. So that's the way it went. And we had a colored cloth all along the line. You'll see that. We'll have friendly flag coming up and bursting, so you'll see a line of that. We'll have smoke bombs, so you'll see those. So don't, don't drop your bombs until after you get across that. Well, Chet and I could see all that, but our bombardier had his head up in the astrodome. You got a 24 in the car. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Yeah, he had his head up in that astrodome right there, watching the lead bomber, because he's going to hit the toggle switch when the lead bomber dropped his bombs. He probably should have been watching all these signs. We were watching it, and by golly, the uh, lead bomber had a malfunction, at least he, that's what he said, had a malfunction, so our bomber here hit the, hit the button and we dropped two, so we happened to be the only two planes that dropped on the English that day. But I think, so the next day we got grounded. We, we, uh, we had to explain what happened. Well, of course, Chet was very unhappy with here. He never flew with us again, but he kicked him out. We were grounded for the next mission, which went up, and this time bombed the American side. And I've got a picture of one of our bombers going down. I can pass it around. Um, and you see that picture in a lot of books. Um, he got he got hit on that particular mission, and. Uh, uh, one guy did get out, but can you imagine trying to get out of an airplane that's not flying straight in London? That was bottom side up. And uh, they never told us how to get out. I don't think you could out of that. With all that paraphernalia. Yeah. Um, you had a story too. Uh, about what happens when the bombs don't drop, or what happens when you can't make it to the target, or I mean, oh, oh. yeah, bombs and um, <clears throat> we did have uh, one mission. We got out over the Adriatic. Most of the format was done over the Adriatic because if you went 50 miles north, you were over enemy territory. So uh, we would form up about uh, over the Adriatic, and at this one time, one of our motors 
Jesus, thank goodness it happened. I just think of that. It happened, it happened while we were in the air. One of them, low oil pressure. And we had to decide whether we were going to continue the mission or not. And we didn't think that motor was going to keep going. And if it didn't, it couldn't keep up with the formation. So we decided to come back and land. Well, when we got back, we said, well, what will we do with the bombs? And we were told, well, you can land with them. Well, we should know, because that was more weight. But do fly around for a couple of hours to get rid of some of the gas. Well, we did that. But then we landed. And with all that weight, and only a short runway, our brakes didn't work. <laughs> so, so we just kept right on going down the runway. We went off the end, and there was a diagonal ditch down there. And the front end of the airplane was slowed down quite a bit with it. Fell in the ditch, and really, gee, I just got thinking, the bottom of the air, and then the navigator were up in there. <laughs> and anyway, they came out and okay. We went into that ditch and just wiped out the front of the airplane. And that didn't hit the bombs at all, or set them off? Well, if, if uh, we shouldn't have had them, but if it had been any worse, those bombs and the gas we had gone up, and this guy wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> I had a scary thought after you walked away from that. Yeah. We were all kind of nervous, and the, the people from the, the tower, the, the big boss, came out started questioning us, what, what were you doing? He asked me what I'm doing. I said, I'm lifting the flap. They looked up and down. <laughs> they should be. <laughs> I was a little bit excited. So except for that one, or this one, were you, were you always able to make it back safely? Mm -hmm. okay. oh. How many missions did you do? I only did uh, nine before the war ended. Uh -huh. That's probably the, you usually, you're supposed to do about 25. But, uh, nine was <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if I've missed any, uh, oh, left, but did I miss any of the, the big stories, any of the stories you wanted to make sure we, we got told? Gosh, I can't think of it. Do you want to take a couple questions? Sure. Yeah, back there. Mr. Bender, what did you do after the war? What did you do after the war? Well, um, I think, uh, incidentally, uh, the, the government was kind of generous, I thought. They gave uh, people who flew 50 down, 50 percent greater pay, and I thought they were just being nice to us. But it turns out that was hazard pay. They figured that it was kind of hazardous to fly those things, and they did that with the submariners too. They gave them 50 percent. But anyway, uh, the government gave us a GI Bill, and I went back to Cornell and finished Cornell and became a high school teacher, chemistry. Did a little farming too, right? Oh, then. <laughs> yeah. Question for you. There's always been a lot of stories about the, the weather was tough over those areas that you were flying because you were going over the you know, high mountains and heavily wooded and so forth. So while you were there, to what extent was the weather a big impact? It was. It was the, sorry, it's real quick. The question is uh, what was the impact of the weather on your missions well, and on your experience? Uh, we had to fly over the Alps. And the Alps were pretty high, and we were still climbing. We were climbing all the way. That old plane just wobbled, 160 miles an hour. And uh, we had to fly close formation all the while. But when you flew over those mountains, the guns were closer to so we had to get by that. But we did, at one time, got into some clouds. And uh, I was flying formation. You had to fly close to keep your fire for them. And um, I, I was flying cross combat cockpit and the, on a guy right next to me. And all I could see was the belly turret. And I was, I said, my gosh, I don't know whether I'm flying upside down or crossways or anything else. I didn't have any flight instruments on my side, so I couldn't tell. The pilot had them all on his side. So I, I when you want to change pilots, you shake the wheel. So I shook it pretty hard, and he couldn't understand why I would monitor why he was flying. But he was closer, and he had the influence, and he could fly on that bubble. But no, none of the pilots liked it. You couldn't see the whole plane that you were flying against. You could have a, a, little, a little accident there. So when yeah, you got through with that, that particular guy that ended that mission, they uh, wouldn't let him fly another. 
as a leader. Now you were you were a co-pilot yeah. most of the time, or you became I was, a pilot. I, when I got through there, they gave me a. I was designated the first pilot. Yeah. Uh, I flew co-pilot all while I was there. Okay. What I was curious, you began in '43, correct? I as yeah. Far I actually, to school and really most, most of my training was in '43. Yeah. Because in in '42, the B-25 uh, Doolittle used it to to fly off aircraft carrier to bomb Tokyo and I was thinking I was I was curious because when you mentioned that plane weighed 60,000 pounds I was wondering how much the B-25 uh, weighed to fly off an aircraft here that only had 435 feet to fly off yeah. and would that liberator could have been relieved of a whole lot of equipment to lighten it in order to do that? Or was that bigger than a B-25 that could not get out? Oh, that so, would have been much bigger. Much the, the question is, uh, you pointed out that the Doolittle raid uh, had used B-25s and had flown them off of yeah. aircraft carriers with a runway length of about 450 feet. Uh, and so obviously they were much lighter than the, the Liberators, which sometimes didn't get off the ground after 5,000 feet yeah. of runway. So would the Liberators have been able to be lightened in any way to have been used in, in that kind of capacity? No way could they use a Liberator on that, but uh, the B-25 uh, had two motors. It was yeah. lighter. They put turn that air, uh, that uh, flat top into the winds and go as fast as they could. So yeah. that would give them some help, and then they could get off. And then I also heard that on the B-25, there was only a six-foot clearance between the tip of the airplane and the bridge yeah. when it took off. And I thought, man, I might be a little bit worried about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, over here, question. Um, were any of your crew ever hurt during any of No. The, the question was, were, were any crew members ever hurt on any of your missions? No, we were lucky. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, navigator, our navigator, he was the old man, he was 25. Um, he, uh, they asked him to fly with another crew once, and that crew did get into trouble. Uh, they put a pole right through the wing. Uh, and uh, he, <laughs> that kind of scared him, but when he got back, he uh, got up on the airplane wing and put his feet in the hole and had a picture taken of him. <laughs> but he wasn't hurt himself. But that, was, that was getting pretty close. That was from a flag? That was that from flag? Yeah, yeah, flag. Yeah, yeah. that's an 88 millimeter German. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm not sure if y'all had jack seats back then in, in those planes, but uh, was there ever a situation where there was like a near death experience and you may have had to jump out for any reason? Did, did you ever get close to having a near-death experience and thinking you were going to have to bail out? Um, and was there an ejector seat on that piece? And what was the last part? Was there an ejector seat on that Oh, thing? no, 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 ejector seat. No, you had, to, you had all this stuff on. And they made them as uncomfortable as they could. Those <laughs> and we had uh, the pilots who sat in cast iron seats about two inches thick. Because if you lost the pilots, the plane would go to down, so we were really protected, except in the front. Front, you just had glass, and if you're flying formation between the and right behind the next guy, sometimes you'd look up there, and that 18 year old had his gun pointed right in your cockpit, which wasn't much fun. <laughs> yes. Um, how is your wife doing right now? Uh, how's your wife doing right now? Um, oh. she passed away earlier this year. Oh. So. 72 years. He wants to be like you when he grows up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I, I've had, I can't complain. I, I've had a good life. Question in the back there. Uh, two questions. Were you always based out of the same airfield, Nelly? And then also, uh, what was the typical squadron size that you 
go off? How many B-24s would you fly with on a mission typically? So the question is, were you always stationed in the same airfield? And how big were, were the formations when, you, when you'd go on raids? How many planes were Oh my gosh, there? I was amazed. Uh, probably every, in our place we had a, a, a group, and the group consisted of four uh, squadrons, and each squadron had six airplanes in it normally. And uh, we would get off all of our people and all these other air, airports would send theirs off. And one time I looked back, and my gosh, there were hundreds of airplanes. I don't know whether we all flew the same target or not, but it was very impressive to look. Of course, you didn't have time to look back very much. It was very impressive to see all those airplanes flying. Now, did they have journalists taking pictures of, of like when you would have that hundreds of people going up at one time, to document that for posterity or anything? Were there journalists embedded with? Uh, I, with I I think there were. And that's how you come to you got that picture. Yeah. But um, that, we that. ourselves were not supposed to carry, carry cameras. Uh -huh. And uh, another thing, when we dropped our bombs, we were supposed to look down and see what they hit. And uh, and everybody on the plane was supposed to take a look. We were interrogated when we got back, uh -huh. and or briefed, I probably should say. <laughs> And uh, our navigator, I looked down there once, and uh, we dropped our bombs, and he was sitting like this on three or four black suits. And I said, uh, Carl, you're supposed to be taking notes on where those bombs hit. And look out and see it. I said, I'll remember everything. <laughs> he, he, he just passed. <laughs> now, could you see at 15,000 feet, could you see what you hit? 25,000. Yeah we, yeah, we could see puffs, and we could see uh, make out buildings, okay. railroad yards, and that sort of thing. So from 25,000 feet, you could tell if it was mm -hmm. know, like a but warehouse it's... or whatever? Wow. Well, no, we couldn't. Not that good. No. Not that, okay, but that it was a cluster of buildings that you were aiming for, though, yeah. at least? But actually, I, I didn't work out very much, because <laughs> 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 the Chet and I had to keep it in oh, yeah, yeah. We didn't want to hit the other guy. What does what did it take? Now, a bombardier or a, a bomber couldn't be an ace. Uh, a fighter or pilot could be an ace. Yeah. And that was what twenty-five planes to be an ace. Five. Uh, five. Five would make you an ace. But, uh, yeah, you're right. The bomber pilot he just flew an airplane and dropped bombs. Five. Five. Okay. In the in the. He said that there's just five planes shot down by an American to become an ace. There was a German pilot who shot 155 planes down and would become an ace. Not only Russian, but American too. So what my curious was, why didn't they make pilots from bombardier or bombers aces too? So the, the question is, why couldn't bomber pilots uh, be uh, be considered aces? For one thing, I never saw an enemy aircraft. <laughs> that, that one, I think our uh, the uh, Tuskegee people kept them away from. Us. Yeah. So uh, I never saw one. Well, there was the movie on uh, Tuskegee Airmen, and at the very end, it it didn't memorize just Americans, but they said there was over 250,000 airmen killed during World War II. And I thought, man, that's, that's quite a lot for air. Yeah. I well, mean, you see, we lost half of our planes. So yeah. And there's 10, 10 men on each plane, so yeah. you multiply those yeah. 1,700 planes by 10 men, there's 17,000. And I, I've got a very good friend of mine that left his grandfather's book with me, notebook. And he was a prisoner of war. He was in the Air Force. Got shot down, captured, and was in a POW camp for almost two and a half years. And he left his notebook with me, and I've read through it a number of times. And I'm glad you didn't get captured, because <laughs> what I read, man, <laughs> 
I'm glad he didn't get captured too. Uh, let's make this the last question in the back there, unless you had one since you had two more questions. One over here. Uh, I might be generalizing, but uh, did they regionalize the bombers to that I mean, like, I always heard B-17 out of England over Germany, and the 24s in Italy going north. Were the, Is that regional? They... Were the bombers regionalized? So, you know, you often hear about the B-17s, the Flying Fortresses, flying out of England, the Liberators flying out of Italy. Were they regionalized, or was there some crossover? Well, um, you hear more about the 17 because it looked nice and it flew, it was easy to fly, <laughs> but they had fewer of them, only 5,000. They had 5,000 fewer uh, 17s were built than 24s. They had a lot more 24s. But uh, we did have both the 17s and 24s in Italy. They were both there. But we had more 24s. And they flew like a Mack truck. <laughs> So, I was wondering if you've ever had a chance to be in any modern military aircraft, and if not, which one would you like to fly in? Oh, um, have you ever been in any modern military aircraft, and uh, is there one that kind of catches your eye that would be, you think would be really fun to fly? <laughs> well, when I got out, uh, I did go join a flying club, and uh, I flew a uh, Cessna 180, which was nice four-place plane, and really I never had any desire to fly the jets. I wouldn't even know how to get the engine going. <laughs> Maybe it would lighter. All right, so uh, how do you feel about one last question? She just okay. shot her hand up. Were you able to stay in contact with Chet after the war? Did you stay in contact with Chet uh, after the war? Yes, I did. Uh, he, he, uh, I, I, I was called up again. Uh, they wanted me to fly. They said we need pilots in the uh, Korea. Korean War, and uh, I said, uh, "Well, I got my draft board." Said, oh, "You got to come." I said, "I'm not going to go. I don't want to go." And they said, "Well, you got to." And I said, "No, I got points, <laughs> and I got a family, and uh, and uh, I didn't go, but uh, I could. I could have very well gone to that one and probably to the Vietnam War too, uh, as long as I." Stayed healthy with the starving rat. <laughs> but did, and did Chet? Chet, stay? Uh, Chet stayed in, or he was called back, and he stayed in. He, he flew the B-32 over Japan, and uh, he came back and became an instructor. And he he wrote a lot of stories and put them in the, the 464th uh, website, which you can Google up. Four sixty fourth bomb group, seven seventy ninth squadron, Chet Schmidt. And I didn't know, know that he had done that. And I, when I found out, I called. I went back and I said, "Well, I'm going to thank him for doing it." I never even kept a diary. And uh, I looked him up and found that he died two years previous. So, what was that website again? Four sixty fourth bomb group. Yeah, if you if you Google four sixty fourth bomb group, it's it'll come right up. And there are. Uh, bunch of pictures from Italy and, and there are pictures of, of in-flight uh, missions and you can see what he was talking about with the flak bursts and the black smoke and everything and, and the formations and, and all that. Chet Schmidt. Yeah, Chet, Chet put a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of his stories and remembrances. He wrote a lot for that. Chet Smith? Schmidt. Schmidt. Oh, Schmidt, okay. Well, thank you for your service. You have been most interesting. Thank you for your service. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I do want to say uh, personally thank you, GP, for for doing this. Um, I, you know, as a historian, I really appreciate your your stories. But as your grandson, I appreciate him even more, thank and I'm very proud of you. And, and thank you. <laughs> uh, I don't know. You could ask that question. I'm not sure.